For all intents and purposes, the health, fitness, and wellness industry is failing. Look, its intended goal is to help people improve their health, get leaner, stronger, more fit, more healthy, and yet people are worse. Worse health, more obesity, more mobility issues. Look, uh, I hate to admit this, but we're sucking right now. We are losing this battle, and in today's episode, we're gonna talk about why we're losing this battle. And if you work in this space, listen carefully. We're gonna talk about what we can do to work together to turn the tide of this war. Do you think we're getting worse or better? Uh, health is worse. Chronic health. That's a fact. Right? Yeah. There's, there's, there's no debate on whether we're getting healthier or unhealthy uh, at a faster rate. That's no debate. But the, the debate to be had is, is the health and fitness space getting better or are we getting worse? You know, I, I don't know how you would judge that. Yeah. I think well, part only, of part of the factor has to be whether the, the majority is getting healthier or not. That's the only way. So that's well, I don't think that's I think there's more to it, right? There's still some accountability. Like what else would you look at? I mean, how we how we deliver the message and the information that we're presenting and, you know, uh is how the science evolving, like things like that. I think there's ways to 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 measure that or at least discuss it. Um and I I, I go back and forth on whether I think that uh, we are better as an industry or we are worse. It's like, hard to say where we would be if the health, fitness, and wellness industry didn't exist. Like, okay, so we're getting worse. We're getting fatter. We're sicker. Chronic health issues are getting worse. Um, would that be even worse right. if this industry... That's a, that's a hard thing to... Mm -hmm. You have to at least ask, give it that much credit that there's potential that it could have been I mean, two times worse. Maybe, right? right? I mean, we know enough people where, where health and fitness changed their life that it helped them. But if we just use the simple, and I know it's too black, it might be too black and white, but if we use a simple criteria like across the board, are people healthier or, or less healthy today than they were 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago? And the answer is they're worse. And so if our goal is to turn the tide and get people from getting worse, then we are losing. And unfortunately, maybe it's a battle that can't be won. I don't know, but I can definitely... There's definitely things we're doing wrong. Do you think there's a unifying message out there in terms oh, of definitely not <laughs> right? Like I, <laughs> definitely not. I, that's I guess a big that's, problem. I guess that's where my uh, my concern is, um, and I think it's very reflective of just how we consume information now because there's so much good information, but there's um, there's always a counterpoint. There's always a uh, an undermining philosophy there somewhere that somebody is angling to uh, get you to purchase something or, or be more uh, inclined to, to go in that direction of training or nutrition, or uh, it seems very fractured uh, in terms of our space, uh, in terms of our overall message of just for your average person, here's how you get healthy. Oh, no, hundred percent. It's disjointed. It's scattered. Look, uh, this is not a, a secret. If you're fighting a, uh, an opponent, right? You're against uh, another army. One of the most effective strategies that you could do to win is to cause or create or um, drive infighting amongst your enemy. Get the different tribes and groups to start arguing and fighting each other. Well, they can't win a war if they're fighting each other. All we do in our space is this. Like if I say the wellness, health, fitness, and performance segments of our space, first off, all of those most of the time are at odds with each other. Within those spaces, people are at odds with each other. And they're the ones that are putting out and competing for consumers, so they continue to put their information out. And who typically wins is the one that can present the information in the most cool, catchy way. The loser is the average person. Because if they try to navigate our... Look, this is the whole... This is literally the reason why we started the podcast, was exactly what I'm talking about. We, we worked with clients for decades... And all of them were so frustrated navigating the space. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much counter information. I mean, you have the health space, which is, I, I guess you would consider the medical health space, right? Doctors, nurses, traditional kind of would be considered your traditional health. Then you even, have wellness. Even they suck. Then you have fitness. You're right. So that's it's, the point. That's been rough. Is yeah. that that all of these spaces, there's, there's stuff in common that they could bring together and push forward if they just learn how to work together, but that's not what's happening. And I think that's a big reason why kind of, we're failing. Money's involved. That's why. 
There's there's money in uh, dividing and conquering. There's money in uh, making villainizing somebody else's method or ideology. And so, so long as that uh, we're motivated by money and rewarded for doing those things, it's I, I don't know if it ever gets solved. You know, I mean, in in a in a free market society, the only thing you can help hope for is that the best ideas, yeah, the out. best ideas and message eventually you know rises to the top and wins. I think that, but I think that we're in this interesting time right now with health and fitness. I mean, it was in our lifetime when it was not a popular thing early on when we were younger kids and stuff like that. It wasn't, it wasn't an industry. It wasn't really a space. There wasn't mm -hmm. even a lot of money in it. It's been relatively new that, that it's exploded and turned into like legitimately a, a place that you can build serious wealth and you yeah. can, a great career in and like that didn't exist just two, three decades ago. So you know, we're going through this growth phase of part of that is, uh, you know, weeding out all the bad information and the charlatans and stuff like that. And of course, a lot of them are going to make a lot of money uh, on the rise of the industry. But you got to hope that, again, that the cream rises to the top and uh, eventually outcompetes the bad idea. You know what's sad about this whole thing? It, 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 it took me, well, I figured this out kind of early on. I know you guys did too, because you guys had good careers and you managed other people. I realized, especially when I had my wellness studio, that if I worked with other people, <clears throat> if I wasn't always just trying to battle everybody and really try to communicate the message uh, that we all had in common, I didn't lose customers. I don't, no. If anything, I got more. More, yeah. If anything, I got more business from, uh, from doing it that way. You know, fitness and health is a lifestyle. So really that's the only way to do it in both that both hits the success that actually helps a person, but also hits the success in the sense that makes you financially successful. Otherwise what happens, and this is what we're stuck in, in our space is who can catch the next fad. Who's going to come out with the next trendy something. And what they're doing is they're capturing this moment of motivation that people get into when they feel bad about themselves, which doesn't last. Eventually they go off. And what they're, what they're all doing is fighting over that. Who can capture people when they're in that moment of self hate and nobody is trying to figure out how we can solve this forever, how we can get people on this journey and make this a lifestyle. And the result of which is number one, it's a big industry, but it could be bigger. It could be bigger. The health, fitness, and wellness industry. Let me ask you guys a question of all the industries that exist, which one is, is positioned best with what's within them positioned best to solve our health issues, right? Yeah. It's that. Yeah. Yeah. It could be so much bigger than it is if everybody just figured it out that if we work together, not only is are we going to succeed at getting people healthy in real ways, we'll all make more money as a result of it. I mean, here, here's your evidence right now. Your average gym charges how much per month? It's like 20 bucks a month yeah. to go to a gym and have access to all this equipment. They know you're not going to show up. How much does a cell phone cost? Or, you know, or, or how much do people spend on Starbucks? Why, are, why is this happening? Because we suck. Yeah. We suck at providing value. Really, if, if people really understood the value, gyms would be, it would be a much different market and there'd be a much, lot more specialty. The economy, I mean, yeah. like healthy people, you know, with it, uh, in terms of like our healthcare system in general, like it's going to help in that direction. You yeah. know, there's just so many benefits to greater a healthy too. person that's out in society that's going to have a healthy outlook and is, is going to be a vibrant, energetic uh, a person that's that's looking to benefit people around them uh, versus kind of where we're at right now, which is again, we're so disjointed. And and you brought up even you know just the medical industry too, and like uh, how fractured that's been over the past few years, and just the type of service like we're 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 providing people now, and how that's all changed. And so yeah, we have a very big uphill battle in terms of, but it all starts here. It all starts with that ownership of like your own. Uh, uh, efforts that, that go in towards your own health and, and how to make those ha healthy habits and how to stick with those healthy habits. I, I do think there is a unique characteristic to the fitness industry that perpetuates this problem. That's, that's different than most other spaces. Um, not that it do, it's not in other spaces, but it's, I think it's the um, amount of people in our space, it's unique uh, the, how great are the percentages, and that's the scarcity mindset. Yeah, I, I feel like in our space, it's greater than any other space, and I think that has a lot to do with the type of person that's attracted to the space to to be 
a voice or to to build a business in it. I think most of us were driven by deeply rooted insecurities and and the things that made us quote unquote successful at fitness are those insecurities. And a lot of times the natural progression to that is to then build a business or start a, a company or work for a company related to that field because it's helped you so much. But in reality, you haven't moved beyond that you know, insecurity. And so that you operate from a place of scarcity. And I just think that's greater in our space than, than anywhere else. You know, what's funny Mm -hmm. is that when I first started, I, uh, I value or I I rated my success as a trainer by the dollars of training that I could sell every month, how many people I could sign up Mm -hmm. and what was the amount of, of revenue that I could generate. And it wasn't that long before I started to realize that uh, I could sign up people all day long. I'm very convincing. I could whatever, but people were not maintaining what we had accomplished together on their own. They just couldn't. It was like my fail rate was as high as everybody else's fail. I could yeah. just sign up more people. And I remember looking at that. You talk about the same thing, Adam, where you're mm-hmm. looking at it and you're like, okay, I'm really not a good trainer yeah. if this is what's happening. And what's when I changed my approach to sustainability, longevity, really getting this person to really figure this out, I didn't lose sales. I made more sales. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to communicate to people in our space that are watching right now is this is not a sacrifice of your business. Your business will grow mm-hmm. if you do it this way. We have this this weird skewed idea that, oh, if I do it in the right way, I'm not going to sell as much. I'm not going to make as much. Not true. You'll do better if you do it uh, this way. All right. Today's giveaway. Again, it's launch. Uh, season for a brand new program. So we're going to give it away for free. Maps, old time strength. If you want to win, you got to do the following. Leave a comment below this video. The first 24 hours that we drop it, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. Now, everybody else, because it's a brand new program, it's on sale. $80 off. Plus you'll get two free eBooks, forgotten muscle and strength building secrets and living a fully optimized life. The sale ends August 27th. If you're interested, click on the link at the top of the description below. Otherwise, go to mapsoldtime.com and use the code OLD80. All right, back to the show. So the first thing, I think the first big mistake that all of us make, um, especially the people that seem to get the most views and eyes, um, is that we communicate perfect too much. Like it's, we get so in the weeds with, yeah. Wait 90 minutes before you drink your coffee, get 15 minutes of sun exposure, make sure you eat your food and it comes from these sources and chew your food in this particular way and make sure you walk, you stand up for at least five minutes after whatever and grass fed. No, it's fish. No, it's vegan. Uh, you know, no, it's uh, this, you know, nutrient. No, it's that nutrient. It's like we communicate perfect so much that the average person, we lost them completely mm-hmm. because they're so far from perfect that if I communicate to the average person, oh yeah, what you need to do is you need to lift weights four days a week and then three days a week, you need to do specific cardio. Every day you need to do mobility. I mean, I lost you already. You're like, I don't even work out once a week. There's no way I could do all that. Uh, you know, I'm done. And so I end up just talking to a bunch of other fitness fanatics. We're not extending a hand. We're just standing on a pedestal looking down. Oh, that's, 100%. that's what it looks like. What a great me. analogy. Well, we also care too much about how perfect we sound versus how helping somebody. This is why too you see situations where, you know, uh, and you'll get a, a really intelligent or experienced, knowledgeable fitness expert who is putting down, you know, some insta famous kid who's got a lot of people that they're helping and supporting. But the truth is that that kid has found a way to help more people than this person who has got a higher education, more experienced, and their angle is to put that person down versus looking and going like, what is he doing that I'm not doing to communicate to the masses like that? And of course, they'll default right away to the, oh, he's just you know, showing his fancy cars and he's doing all these things that are just, but it's like, there's also something in there that are communicating around health and fitness that is, it's breaking through to a group of people that that other person isn't, isn't getting through to. Yeah. You know, we had a, uh, someone, I don't know if you guys saw this last week, somebody asked me uh, a question on my, on my live, uh, my live Q and a, and it was, they asked me if I get really mad 
about the people that come on our, our uh, Mind Pump Media IG and answer the questions. You ever notice like on oh. our quads? <laughs> they're trying to scour for Yeah, and they're trying, they're or, trying yeah. to, to poach clients off of that. Yeah. And I said, I said no, it, it doesn't bother me at all. And I said, uh, it reminds me when people used to ask me or used to think that I was crazy for allowing other trainers to train my clients. They'd always say to me, like, aren't you worried that the trainer is going to shark your people and they're not going to come back to you? Just like the same question. You know, the people are going to shark these people and we're not going to get it. It's like, I, the way I look at it is like, that's a, a great reflection of myself. And like, mm -hmm. if somebody else can get on our, our my IG and communicate the information that we've been busting our ass better for last us. better yeah. than us, <laughs> yeah, it's shame on us to help that person. Yeah. Then it's a win. Right. Yeah. That, and, and, and it also serves as a, an educational tool for me. Like, Oh, wow. I, I could get better at yeah. communicating mm -hmm. that because this person came on my IG and said a few things and won that person over uh, after all the stuff that we've put out, put out for free and tried to help people. Like, I don't look at that as like, oh, you're trying to poach me or, oh, man, that's going to hurt my business. I look at it as like, oh, I could be better about how I communicate that. I just think that. I think that's rare in our space. I think the natural reaction for most fitness people is to have this knee jerk reaction yeah. and go like, Oh, fuck you. And like, turn it into this like competition These with each mine. other. Yeah. When it's like, wait a second, if we both agree that the goal is to help as many people as possible and somebody else comes on my page or somebody else finds a way to communicate that information, to get these people to change their behaviors mm -hmm. for the good and they move in the right direction. I don't look at that as like a competition thing. I look at that as an opportunity to me for get even better at communicating this information. 100%. Yeah. And you don't lose that client, by the way. You know when you lose clients? When you when they sense that you're afraid of them getting better information and you, yeah. try, to, you try to suck them yeah. in. I, so I remember distinctly switching how I approached health and fitness in regards to this um, early in my career. I did this way too often in the beginning. Somebody would come to me, they'd tell me they only have a couple days a week they could work out or they don't want to change their diet just yet or whatever. And I would sit there and try to convince them to make all the changes now. Mm -hmm. I would sit there and communicate perfect. Like, I know you only said you could work out twice a week, but really if you worked out four days a week, here's what you could do. And I know you don't want to touch your diet, but let me just show you what we could do if we change this, that, follow the meal plan. Otherwise it's a waste of time. I remember saying stuff like that. Yeah. And either I would convince them and then they fail, okay, shortly after, or I would blow them out and they wouldn't sign up with me. And then I would feel good about it. Like, well, they weren't serious type of deal. And when I had that, that you know, that kind of self-reflection, like, am I really helping people? This was one of the first things that I changed. I'll never forget. It was my favorite example. I've used this before. I had a client come in, referred to me by one of my doctor uh, clients. I used to train doctors. And at some point they started referring to me patients. And this particular doctor had been working on this patient, trying to get her in for a long time, telling her, hey, look, you need to work out. It'll be good for you. And this person's like, so anti-gym. I hate that atmosphere. I hate the whole thing, whatever. Finally convinced her. She came in to see me. And I remember that I had other trainers sitting at desks next to me when this all happened. So she comes in. I introduce myself. First words out of her mouth. I'm only working out one day a week. I'm not doing anything on my own. And I'm not touching my diet. And I don't want to get sore. And I remember hearing Snickers from the trainers behind me thinking I was going to blow her out. And I said, no problem. We'll start that way. Now I had learned at this point that if I'm going to convince this person to do anything more than what they're committed to, my best, my best chance would be to get them in within the, whatever they told me they can do and then show them something, show them something, give them a good experience. And that's what happened. I said, yeah, no problem. And I remember the look on the person's face when I said that, she was shocked. She thought I was going to tell her, don't bother. And I give her a nice reason to not come in. I said, yeah, no problem. Once a week's fine. She's like, it is. I said, yeah, we could. Are you doing anything now? She said, no. I said, well, once a week's more than, than what you're doing now. You'll definitely get stronger. We don't have to touch your diet to improve your strength. Um, of course, if you worked on diet, probably would get better, but that's okay. I'll start where you're at. You'll come in. You probably, you might get a little sore the first time as we start to figure out the right intensity, but then soreness is not something I aim for. And we had this wonderful conversation. She signed up and literally this is how it worked out. For a year, I trained her once a week. Then she asked if I could train her another day a week. Then she asked if she could have exercise to do on her own. Then she said, how do I cut sugar out of my diet? Then she said, I should cut heavily processed foods out of my diet. So over the course of three years, completely transformed this woman's life. And she became somebody where this was a part of her life. Had I not approached it that way, had I communicated perfect to her, she yeah. would have never started. We would have lost her forever. Well, it's an interesting sort of philosophical um, 
conundrum. I think like a lot of trainers when they first start, like they want to show their worth so much and they want to be so involved uh, with all these decisions. And really it's, it's very condescending because the person coming in, you don't think that they didn't think maybe some more time carved out in their day would probably (laughs) help or like, maybe I should get more sleep or, you know, maybe I should, uh, you know, move this meeting. And so I can have more workout. Uh, you know, they, they've thought of all those things already. And, you know, like, so you can, you can do a lot in terms of the beginning of like, that might be their, their thought is like, well, I got to go hire a coach. I got to have them tell me what to do. I got to have them uh, provide me with just a meal plan or something that's like, here's these things and I'm just going to follow this. And it's, it's not their idea. They didn't come to conclude that they didn't find themselves there. So this is none of this is their journey. This is just something that you've you've conjured up and, and written for them. And um, what you find out later as you mature as a trainer is that you have to you have to work with them on their journey to find wh- where that path is taking them. Totally. And so you foster that all the way through from the very beginning, wherever they are. So you're able to shape and cultivate that for them instead of uh, just stamping it. Here's, here's all the answers to the test. Boom. Just follow it. Well, what's more effective, uh, a client showing up because you're basically forcing them to show up to an extra day right. fear or yeah. the client coming in an extra day because that's their idea. Oh, that's a leadership question, right? Like oh. ma- managing out of fear versus on motivation to 100%. support. Yeah, no. Uh, so I was going to ask what you guys think is the root cause of that. Like what caused us? We all experienced that. We all probably came from a place like that. Does it go back to the insecurity? Is it, I'm so insecure about my knowledge because I'm so green and new. And so I feel I need to be authoritative and, I'm, and tell you like, I th- this is what you need to do. Like, oh, one day a week, huh, that's not going to get you. I think that's what part it? of it. But yeah. I also think if you have good intentions, you look at the person and you know how big of an impact like good health would have with this person. And so you just want to give them all the answers. You just want to tell them, oh my God, yeah. you really want to do this? You're excited too, yeah, to oh, help them. Here's yeah. your diet. Here's your workout. It'll change your entire life because you know what it could do for them. But that's not how people learn. That's not how people develop lifelong habit. It doesn't work that way. It just, it just doesn't. Well, but I get, I used to get so excited because I was like, oh, I could totally fix you. Just do everything I tell you. I know exactly work what you need to do. Yeah, I, yeah. I think part of it too, I think that's the, <coughs> the early years where you lean heavy on the science and the, yeah. the studies yeah. and what the research says, right? And the research says that this many days per week at this rate will, you know, give you this one and anything less than that is less likely to whatever. So I think this is an area where, you know, you, you learn some of this new information through studies or certifications and you go, Oh, so then you go back and you're, you, you forget about the behavioral aspect or you don't know about the behavioral aspect yet. You haven't accounted Mm -hmm. for, Oh, that's great. This is what the research says that they should be doing. But what I realized over my decades of training was, Oh God, 90% of those people can't follow that protocol so what do I have to do in order to potentially yeah. get to them that? Oh, okay. Well, now I have to make different decisions or- I don't think that's discussed, to be honest with you. And yeah. A lot of the um, education and the certifications, and they don't go too heavy on behaviors. And like you, you learn through experience. That's one of the biggest things. Like you don't, you don't really see how this all plays out because you haven't worked with enough human beings. Yep. And human beings are complex. And it, there's a lot of variables you don't anticipate until you actually work with people long enough. Yeah, bottom line, you, you, when you're talking with someone, if we're trying to reach, by the way, we're trying to reach the people who are getting fatter, who are getting sicker, who have poor health issues, okay? These are not fitness fanatics. There's a hierarchy of steps that this person can take. Stop communicating perfect because that's not how you get there. You don't get there by jumping from where you're at now to perfect. In fact, that's a guaranteed way to fail. You do steps, which might mean, and I've done this before. Hey, first step, drink an extra glass of water a day. Oh, how much weight am I going to lose? Nothing with that, but that's the first step. Let's build a habit there. Or the first step, walk for five minutes. Am I going to get totally fit from that? No, but you might notice something from it. And you might, the only thing you might notice is that you can do it. And then that might encourage you to take the next step. There's a hierarchy of steps And if we communicate perfect as the only way or fight with each other over who's more perfect, what we're communicating to the average person is you're wasting your time unless you do everything perfect, unless you eat meat from, you know, cows that were blessed by a monk and they're grass fed and they only eat, you know, grass that's organic and that grows on the West side of the hill because it gets most sunlight or weird shit like that. Like 
you are going to lose everybody because nobody is can even think that that's possible for them. So forget that. The second thing is how condescending our space can be to the average person. This is when they say things mm -hmm. like, you're just lazy. Mm -hmm. You you know, uh, just get off your ass. Pain is, you know, uh, weakness leaving the body type of deal. When you're taught, when you're communicating that to somebody who's never developed uh, behaviors and structure around health and fitness, who also has life stresses and kids, maybe they're dealing with mental health issues, or they have a job. Like, are you going to win anybody over like that? Are you going to win anybody over by looking at them and saying, oh, you know what your problem is? You're just lazy. Yeah. That's your problem. Okay, cool. I'm going to go. Try harder. Yeah. Well, you're an asshole and I'm going to go do this. I'm not going to do this anymore. You know, type of deal. I think the reason why that there's so much of that, because I think there's actually a, a, a percentage of people who actually think they want that and need that. Hmm. There's people that, that that have that you know masochistic type of, of personality where they think like I need yeah. to be beat up. Shame I need me. To be, well, yeah, that's yeah. when you hate yourself so much that that's, it feels good. That's what I mean. Yeah. So I part of why I think it it's perpetuated in our space is because the trainers are getting this feedback of like, oh, my client likes it. Oh, they need it. They need me to talk shit to them. They need me to be condescending because that's what make that's what motivates them. They want that kind of militant personality. And so, and then you add in the 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 hype and motivation bullshit in our space. And so the the combination of that with people thinking that's what they want and need, I think this is what why you get so many of the this the these condescending trainers presenting information. I remember once I had a moment where I realized how condescending I was. I had a family member buy we were i don't remember where we were we we're buying food and they got uh fried chicken okay and they're like oh you know i'm, I'm trying to lose weight so i'm going low carb and like an asshole i scoff like you think fried chicken's healthy now I, I i i saw the look on their face which was like i just shared with you because you're a trainer what i think i'm supposed to be doing and you just made me feel like a complete idiot yeah. and 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 guess what I will never reach out to you again, or now right. I'm embarrassed, or now I'm going to give up. Yeah. And I remember the look on their face and then realizing, wow, what that a- That door just shut. Yeah, what a shitty, why did I scoff? Right. Like, I I, I wasn't supportive, and, and uh, you know, there could have been a much better way that I could have communicated, or maybe nothing. Maybe it was just, they made a comment, and I said, oh, cool, you're trying to go oh, low carb, how come? Yeah. You know? But it was that condescending, like, you know, I would do this too with people when they'd say, I'd say, oh, what do you do for exercise? I walk. You scoff. Never, yeah, I remember being like condescending about that. Like, well, I mean, everybody walks. <laughs> I'm like, that's not really that. I'm Yeah, that. you remember doing that? Yeah, yeah. How many people we turned off because of that type of attitude where it's like, and this is when people feel like they can't connect. Or they, or they break the math down on how many hours are in a day. That's, oh. always, that's a classic. That's a classic condescending oh, thing. Like, like you, like the average person doesn't know how many hours in a day and how many days are in a week. You <laughs> fucking asshole! Like, I really <laughs> yeah. need you to break that. All math. these rituals yeah. you need to do. I yeah. really need you to break that math down for me so I knew how much I was failing at getting in uh, shape. <laughs> or like, you know, uh, I you know I can't afford to buy super healthy food. Oh, really? Because you go to Starbucks every day and I know you buy chips. Let's add up the math and then yeah. you show them. It looks like you could totally gotcha. afford it. You know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has like, that ever yeah. convinced anybody? I mean, no. that, that's the difference between, I've said this before, like the, the good closer and the great closer, right? A good closer has learned all these rebuttals and guilt people, make people feel stupid, ways of overcoming their objections. But a great closer can pull somebody into it can pull yeah. somebody into wanting to make the change to wanting to make the sell like that's and it's through listening and asking a lot of right questions and leading not punking them into thinking what they're doing or just making them feel embarrassed you yeah. know like they're embarrassed to ask you a question you know you ever remember you remember feeling like that in class mm -hmm. where you had a question but you want to ask it because you were embarrassed that's how our space can make people feel we can make them feel like that by the way by being condescending to each other yeah. So the bodybuilder who's communicating something for hypertrophy, then you get the functional mobility, whatever guy, and he's going to talk condescendingly about, oh, well, he probably can't even, you know, he probably can't even go across monkey bars or something like that. Right. Yeah. It's like, but did he communicate something with some value? Like, why are we doing this to each other? That's a, so that's a really, yeah. really good point that can't be highlighted enough because there's a lot of people that don't ask these questions or say anything in, in fear of being rejected. And then another fitness professional says something that that person probably thought or believed. And then the other fitness professional trashes that person. It's the same as you picking on them. Yeah. They, they feel like, Oh my God, I, I, I thought that too. Yeah. And so that infighting amongst us, it just, it, that really, really, and you don't know it. It's, it's silently 
hurting yeah. them and your business and you don't even realize it by being that Meanwhile, way. Meanwhile, everybody's yeah, viewing all of the comments yeah. back and forth and yeah, making their concluding their own uh, ideas and yeah, it just makes them feel even smaller through that whole interaction. Totally. Which brings us to the next one, which is this no empathy. We have no, uh, we're so bad at empathy for the challenges that people have to beginning or starting this journey. And the reason why we have no empathy is because we found this journey oftentimes their own insecurities combined yeah. with obsessive discipline and dedication because we found something that we loved. We made it our career. So for us, it's easy. Oh, you know, working out every day. I wake up at 5 a.m. Oh, eating healthy. You just got to make healthy choices. You know what I tell the fitness professionals and influencers and health people who have no empathy for people who might say it's hard to eat vegetables or it's hard just to walk more? is I like to point out the shit that they're challenged with. So, oh, that's great, John, that you're like that. How's your relationship doing? You know, oh, yeah. is it tough for you? You act like an asshole and you can't control yourself? <laughs> or what about your drug problem? Yeah. Or what about your gambling issues? Yeah. Or what about the fact that you can barely support yourself because you're shitty at, jo at your job? So <laughs> it's like, we all have challenges. Yeah. So every time I hear someone say something to me that's easy for me, I try to remind myself of the stuff that I just can't seem to figure out. This is what we're dealing with with mm -hmm. a lot of these people. They just can't, figure it out. And it's not our job to not have empathy. It's our job to help them figure it out. And they're not you, they're not us. Otherwise they'd be in the space. Otherwise they'd be working as fitness That's professionals. That's because half, half the space is like a, you know, a 15 year old teenager, you know, or like in dog years, right? Their, their experience of being a, a trainer, they're at yeah. 15 years old, you know, regardless if they're 35, 40 or whatever, they're a teenager in, in, in the fitness space still thinking they know it all and they haven't figured out that they what they what they don't know yet and yeah. i think we all experience that i think that's a, a part of the growth and again all of this i i feel like i can connect all of this back to the the insecurity is to that's where and that's why it's unique to this space why i think this is more of a conversation in our industry than it really is in any other competitive industry that's there's lots of competitive industries but I think it's not, it's, it's the most monetized uh, attribute though of anybody coming in is like, if you got insecurities, we got the answer for you. Yeah. You know? And so we're, we're always like looking for that and like sharking on it yeah. uh, right away, which uh, kind of puts us where we are instead of leading with that helpful hand. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you feel shitty about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Come on over here. Yeah. I got the answer for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to beat the shit out of you because you deserve it. <laughs> and you're going to take these pills and it's going to happen really quick. And here's John, look at his before and after totally works. Right. Give us a thousand dollars you know, yeah. type of deal. And the person yeah. ends up, you know, failing. Um, that brings us to the next one, which is, is it's oftentimes an echo chamber. How often do people in the health, wellness, fitness space communicate to each other and not try to reach the people who seem to be unreachable? Mm. I remember mm -hmm. data in gyms. I remember managing gyms and, and they, I remember when this data was presented and it was presented because a competitor had come into the market and had blown open a hole that existed that nobody was paying attention to and really got the attention of a lot of people. So I remember this must have been 1999 when curves started to make a splash in the fitness space. So back then, the gym industry really started taking off in the, I'd say the mid to late 80s. And then by the late 90s, you had some big players like 24 Hour Fitness really start to show the world like, oh, you could, this could be a, a big business. And then all of a sudden, this company shows up and they open up these small studios. They use pneumatic equipment. So this is with air, like air pumps. So it's not even weights, not even weight stacks. There's like seven pieces of equipment that are in a circle. You show up, it's women only. You show up, you do a couple circuits, and then you leave. And they went from zero locations to surpassing the biggest gyms and chains in the world, literally becoming the number one franchise in the world at a particular time. Now they had their own issues and I could see why, and they failed as a result. But what it did is it highlighted what we were all screwing up yeah. over. What we were they were doing? Missing. They were not taking members from 24 Fitness, Gold's Gym, Crunch Fitness. They weren't taking members from us. They were reaching the unreachable. It was people who were embarrassed to go to gyms, who were really overweight, there were women, and they finally felt like they had a place. And we just didn't reach them. And I remember looking at the data and I and, and they showed us. I remember, I'll never forget, we were in a meeting. They're like, you know what we're doing right now? We just trade members between each other. But there's this huge segment of the population we're not touching. Curves figured out how to how to how to reach them and now, now they're destroying it. This is how I communicate the success of the business all the time when I'm asked. 
uh, get asked all the time if I thought that the show and the business would be this big eight years ago. And I quickly always say, absolutely. And that was because when we looked at the space, at all the other podcasts, all the other fitness influencers on social media, they're all talking to the, the same percentage of fitness fanatics. They're all communicating and fighting over the latest study or modality. And it's like, that first of all, the uh, our clientele is everybody. Everybody needs health and fitness. So literally, we have the whole world at our disposal. But we, the space that is competing over this twelve percent. Yeah, and it was like that's not the conversation we want to have. We want to have the conversation that we had with our clients because our clients weren't that twelve percent. No, our clients were engineers, stay at home moms, teachers, doctors, lawyers. Like just they they weren't like following 50 influencers and subscribing to the magazines and on the the bodybuilding forums and arguing over the latest study that came out. Like that wasn't our clients. Our clients were the other 90% of the people. And like, we heard from Oprah that they needed to like move more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, (laughs) Like, yeah, you probably should. Yeah. So there was this huge opportunity to, you know, and and that doesn't mean that we can't communicate to that 12%. I think that we do a pretty good job (laughs) of still communicating to them, but that's not the focus. The focus is, attracting the other 80 to 90 percent that everybody else is losing because they're too busy feeding their own ego fighting over the the other fitness over who's more more right who's who's more more, smart yeah who's more smart come on yeah it's um yeah we're not reaching most people we're not reaching most people because we don't focus on what's going to reach most people and we end up talking to each other and here's the deal most people will should and they have the potential for this. Most people could use fitness, wellness, and health to improve their lives. The people in that 10%, 12% that you're talking about, Adam, the fitness fanatics, live for fitness, wellness, and health. Mm-hmm. Most people don't live for the gym. Most people don't live for their workouts. Most people don't live for it. They use it as a way to improve their lives. Supplements them. Yeah, Mrs. Johnson uh, or you know, Mr. Smith, they just want to be better parents, they want to have less pain. They want to have a better sex life. They want to look a little better in their clothes. They want more energy. Uh, they want to be better employees. Uh, they want to take less medications. That's it. The 10% that we're talking about wants to add another you know, 30 pounds to their bench press, wants to hit some new PR, wants to compete in some new event, wants to figure out how they could squeeze out you know, longer telomeres on their, <laughs> on their DNA, but with the latest, greatest, yeah. whatever. Like, I don't care about those people. Now I don't mean literally, I don't care about you. Cause that's us. Right. I, I, I love hanging out with you guys and stuff, but I'm not trying to like make fit people fitter. Yeah. I'm trying to get well, you're just people not, healthy. You're not moving the needle by yeah. focusing there. You're not, I mean, for every one person you get a little bit fitter, you miss out on a hundred people who miss the message. Cause you're, I mean, how many times did we learn this in the last eight years, even ourselves, right? We went out with this in mind, focused on that yet still like learned our lesson multiple times. Remember on episodes, Remember we, we would do an episode and we'd be like, that is so dumb. It's so basic. Like that people don't want to hit. And it would viral. Yeah. yeah. It would explode compared Most to these listens. And it, we'd, we'd have these conversations off air with each other going like, man, we just got to continue to remember to not overcomplicate this message because every time we think something is too basic or too simple or it's people aren't going to like it. It, it strikes a chord yes. with, the, with the masses. Yes, and 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 that's not to say that we don't talk to uh, the ten percent. I think if anybody's converted more people to becoming trainers, it's us. Even though we talk about the realities of how tra- challenging it is, but what we're trying to do is turn them into real evangelists. The ten percent of the people out there who have really understood and adopted health and fitness, they can act. They're the ones that actually can make the big difference by learning how to evangelize properly. And, and not making the mistakes that we're talking about. The last one, this one is obvious. It's number five, but it probably should be number one, which is that in our space, we perpetuate righteousness or beauty way too much. Now I get it. Beauty in particular, aesthetics, how ripped you are, how buffed you are, how attractive you are. If you want to get a lot of views, a lot of likes, a lot of attention, if you want an easy, very imperfect, but however, easy way to display your potential authority than just be sexy and fit and ripped, right? You 
post pictures of yourself, the average person assumes whether consciously or subconsciously, you know what you're talking about. So it's a very easy way to kind of get attention. Um, the problem is, is that what we're doing is we're selling the side effect, not the main effect. And we're also teaching people uh, to compare themselves to people that, I mean, they're not going to look like, or they don't want to live that way in reality and feel shitty about themselves. And, and that's not a great way to, uh, to really promote health and fitness for everybody. But that's the main, I mean, that's the main way our space sells. And then the righteousness one is like, you know, uh, your way is great, but you also miss this one piece. Your coffee is not as organic yeah. or it could potentially have my, you know, You're not my, waking up early enough like I am. Yeah. Or, Oh, I know you like squats, but it's not as functional as this. Or yeah, I know you told them to eat protein, but unless it comes from these sources then this potential, whatever. Um, and then again, you lose everybody. The highlighting the, the beauty or your body and physiques is, is a, is a tough dance to be had. Right. Because there's, there's a part of like, Obviously, it, it does really well by, you know, presenting yourself very fit and ripped. And if totally. people are going to buy and invest in you teaching them how to eat right and train, uh, looking the part helps, right? But then there's that fine line of I've built my entire brand off of how mm -hmm. I look that I think one of the, the worst parts about that is the amount of pressure that is for you. Oh, it's a hell. I know. To to yeah. not let the natural ebb and flow of life happen where maybe you're not on a hardcore kick for a month or whatever like that, or it's, heaven forbid you get injured or get some major life-threatening disease or another huge priority in your life takes, you know, a, a pro takes the front seat instead of you your physique all the time. And so that's probably the the worst part or the most dangerous part about presenting that so much it's like so but i also understand how powerful it is i understand how it, we're it's a uh, of all the industries and spaces uh we would be up there with the the top three uh most superficial yeah you know like it's it, it, a lot of people that decide to sign up for a gym membership or make a decision to go on a diet uh, is it's around vanity first. It's, it's sometimes it's around health. Sometimes it's the doctor says, Hey, you need to go and do this for X, Y, Z reasons. But I would say a majority of the time it's, it's vanity driven. It's, I want to look better. And so, uh, as a professional, there's this, this, this desire or draw to want to present your physique to show people that I can do what you want to do, but then it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It for is. Sure. I'll, I'll say the remedy is this, cause I get it. I get the social proof of looking the part. I know it's powerful. I don't think it's all bad. Here's what I think the remedy is. If this is what you're going to do as part of the way that you communicate your authority, make sure you balance it with really good, really, really good quality information and make sure you communicate your struggles and imperfections as well. That's more to protect you, by the way. The second part is more to protect you. Not so much for the consumer, although some people do this as a way to like come across as authentic and it could be fake sounding, <clears throat> but really it's to protect you for what you said, Adam. If you get famous on social media uh, as a fitness person, cause you're at 5% body fat, you're screwed. You're going to have to be 5% body fat all the time. Or if you're that girl that looks really hot and you show your butt and you do all this, whatever, and you're 25, you've got a short shelf life with your business. What, you know, you, what are you going to do 10 years later? Oh, you're going to try and retire real quick? Because if you want to continue to build this business, it's going to be hard to continue to kind of keep that up. Or what if you're in public, people recognize you, or they see you drink a soda or live like a normal life sometimes, or, you know, it, it, it doesn't work really well. So that's to protect you. But the first part is for your business. You want to be known for your information and your ideas more than your looks because your looks are fleeting and it's also not that valuable. It really isn't. There's a very small percentage of people that make a lot of money based off their looks. 99.9% .9 of the people watching this right now, that's not going to be you. Just a fact. You're just not. You can get fit and ripped as you want. You're not going to compete with these genetic perfect anomalies who are also obsessed with whatever. So it's also not a good business strategy. A good business strategy is to be known for your ideas. 
those last, those stand the test of time. And if your beauty fades as you get older or whatever, it doesn't matter. People want to know what you think, not necessarily how you look. Well, part of that too, I think is all of us as fitness professionals getting better about communicating what true health looks like too. Uh, it's, I mean, for the longest time, we've celebrated the cover of the magazine look as the <clears throat> ultimate yeah. sign of health. And that actually couldn't be further from the truth. And in fact, a very healthy physique and body there's a wide range of what it could look like. It could, it, you know, it could, it could look on the softer side uh, and then it could look on a much harder side and everything in between. And you could be fall on all ends of the spectrum of health. You could be super ripped and be unbelievably unhealthy inside relationship, unhealthy, financially unhealthy, all these other things unhealthy, but look super ripped. And then you could be super soft, but then have all these other things incredibly in balance. And so I think as a fitness professional, part of your job is teaching people that is learning how to communicate that. So that people understand that just this image of the six pack abs is not everything. Here's how crazy it is. This is how flipped upside down it is of all of the values that improving your health and your fitness and your wellness will provide of all of the values improvements in your beauty is at the bottom it's actually the least valuable thing in your life, I promise you. And it's not just my opinion. The data is clear on this. I remember Arthur Brooks communicating this for happiness. He said, you could be a five on a scale of one to 10, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, train your body, dedicate yourself to being perfect, move yourself up to a nine, and you'll, your happiness will barely tick up a little bit. With all that time and investment, it'll barely tick up a little bit. So it's also the least valuable thing. It's what we celebrate the most though, is how you look. The truth is, how you feel, your cognitive performance, your mental health, learning how to develop that discipline, your the relationships, struggle, your mobility, how it affects your relationships, your energy, libido, like all those things are so much higher than just your beauty. By the way, if you're lucky to live a long life, and I say lucky because some people are unfortunate, don't live very long. If you're blessed and lucky enough to live a long life, you're going to lose your beauty anyway. What do you think you're going to be a hot 65, 70 year old walking around? That's, that's, down at the bottom. There's a very short window for when, you know, that really matters anyway. So the truth is that people it's in our space promotes, and maybe they don't say this, but the way they promote it says this, that beauty is the most important thing that fitness will provide you when in fact, it's actually the least important thing. And I think that's the biggest uh, part of this message. Agreed. Look, mm -hmm. if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free fitness guides. Download them all. They're totally free. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. I'm on Instagram at Mind Pump DeStefano. And Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. <laughs>